All right. Uh, so you've got two things on your plate right now. Of course, the project, which hopefully you've been thinking about the type of job you want to have after you graduate and what's the probable income for that job in the location that you suspect you might be living. And hopefully you've been thinking about what your expenses are going to be and then how both of those things, income and expenses, will shift over time due to cost of living adjustments, due to promotions and raises and maybe changes in life circumstances that can dramatically uh, alter how much you spend on a monthly basis. So the project is one thing that you should be thinking about. The other uh, is your next homework assignment is due a week from today, homework number nine. Today we're going to be talking about, um, it's that illustration that I promised you of why you can't use the internal rate of return to pick the best project. You can only use the internal rate of return for initial screening on whether something's acceptable. So today we're going to go through the illustration that kind of proves that that's the case. Uh, before we do, this figure I showed uh, during that recorded lecture video to summarize the process you go through when you're calculating the external rate of return. Uh, I, at the beginning of the semester, promised that I'd highlight whenever possible like the greatest hits of student mistakes because I've taught this course a lot of times now, and uh, probably on the top 10 list of uh, things that students aren't quite able to do in the way that they should is solve for the external rate of return. So if you didn't watch that lecture video on uh, Friday, then I really strongly encourage you to go back through and work through the in-class exercise so that you at least have one time that you've practiced the external rate of return in addition to the homework of course, but uh, even if you did watch the lecture video, uh, this is a complicated enough procedure that it really is worth doing a second time. And just to uh, hit the high points one last time here in the class, um, what you're doing in this process is you're merging two interest rates together because there's the rate at which the returns are generated and then there's the rate where you're taking those profits and you're putting it into a secondary account. Because remember, we use external rate of return when you can't put the profits into the same project. So they have to be put somewhere else. So the person who sold that rare painting, maybe they put that money into a savings account or into a certificate of deposit. And so if you remember the, uh, the Excel example that I worked through, uh, that painting itself would have been 8% uh, if it was internal rate of return. But uh, let's say that that profits had to be put into a low yield savings account for a number of years, then that uh, kind of a weighted average is what you can think of this external rate of return process as, where you have two interest rates, the external reinvestment rate, and then the external rate of return, which is what you're solving for. So. Um, just so you know, this is an important topic, and it's one that requires a little extra practice. So even if you did the in-class exercise already, I'd suggest looking through it a second time. OK, now, why do we even have to bother doing the external rate of return? Uh, it's because internal rate of return doesn't allow you to identify the alternative that has the most profit. It will only um, give you the interest rate percentage and the difference between the two, the, the one with the most profit and the one with the highest interest rate is think about what you'd rather maximize. Um, let's say you have $5,000 and you have to put it somewhere just because if, if you bury it under your mattress it's going to get progressively less and less valuable due to inflation, right? Prices are always going up and if you just put the money somewhere that it's not generating interest, it's going to get less valuable over time. And you can't let that happen. So one option is there's a bank in town that's offering 10% on their savings accounts. But in the fine print, they say that 10% is only applicable to the first $100 that you deposit. And then the, uh, everything after that is earning 1% interest. And the other bank in town is offering 5% interest, and there's no limit on the deposit. So the question is, should you try and chase after the higher interest rate, even though there's a smaller amount you can actually put into that investment alternative, or should you try and obtain the one that maximizes your profit? And I think 
uh, you probably already see that what we want is to maximize profit. We don't necessarily just want to maximize some arbitrary interest rate. So in the in-class exercise today, what we're going to do is go through an activity where you're comparing two alternatives. And uh, I see a lot of computers, that's good. If you have Excel, that's going to help out with calculating the internal rate of return today. We're going to compare two alternatives, one by the internal rate of return. And the other approach we're going to use is uh, by comparing the present worths. Now here's something that you can always trust. You can always trust the present worth method to identify the best alternative. It'll never lead you astray. If you maximize the positive amount of your present worth, you know, when you're comparing A and B, whichever alternative has the most positive amount at the present is the option you should choose. But when we calculate the internal rate of return for these two options, what you'll see is that the option that has the higher internal rate of return isn't necessarily the one that gives you the same present worth. And what it'll all come down to is the amount of investment that you're putting into each project. Similar to the uh, example that I mentioned to you earlier. One more. Thanks. All right. So if you don't have uh, Excel, you can calculate the present worths using the factor table that's on the back side of the paper. And I'd suggest maybe uh, scooting next to another student to uh, observe them calculating the internal rate of return for each project.
All right. So uh, what it looks like is that if you didn't know that you're not supposed to pick the one with the biggest IRR, like if you always just thought, oh, you should be trying to maximize the highest interest rate, it's probably the best, you might be tempted to choose Project A because Project A has the higher interest rate. Um, but what we see when we do the present value analysis is that it's actually Project B that's going to yield the, uh, the greatest profit. And the reason why is that Project B costs more. Um, and because of that larger investment, you're earning 10.3% on 85,000. And it's better to earn 10.3% on 85,000 than to earn 12.4% on 50,000. On a percentage basis, it may look like Project A is pretty good, but you want to maximize the number of dollars going into your pocket. And so, uh, by the way, what I did in this cell was I used the NPV function. And so remember that when you use the NPV function, you're only supposed to put uh, amounts that are in the future inside of that function. And so outside of that function, I include the amount that's already at the present. So in this case of Project A, it's 50,000 minus 50,000 plus the present value, everything being discounted at 4% of these future amounts. So if we uh, look at the key, The uh, internal rates of return, we already saw in the spreadsheet. If you solve the present worth using the uh, factor table, then here's the solution. You'll get approximately the same amount. So let's see how different is that. Uh, 22,998, well, about the same. I guess it's because that factor has one, two, three, four, five digits. So we don't lose any precision. It would if we tried to calculate the cents. And present worth of option B, 28,553. So if you have to make a decision about whether they're acceptable, both projects are acceptable. I mean, remember, the hard and fast rule is that you should never accept a project where the rate of return is lower than the MAR. Because the MAR is the minimum acceptable rate of return. And oftentimes, that's driven by your borrowing costs. And so if a company is paying 4% to acquire capital, then either of these projects is acceptable. Uh, but now, if you can only select one, and the name for that is a mutually exclusive alternative, and uh, here in the description it said your company can select one of the following two projects. If you could select both, then do, because you'll get even more money if you choose option A and option B. Later on in the semester, we're going to address the issue of budget limits and how sometimes uh, you can choose multiple alternatives, but at the same time, you don't have an unlimited budget for these initial investments. And so we'll go through the process of, for maybe dozens of alternatives, figuring out which bundle of options yields the highest profit. In this case, since we're only doing one, then option B is the most profitable, and it's the one that should be selected. OK, now what about the concept question? Um, if you borrow money at the MAR, what does the present worth represent? I, I see some papers that are not yet filled. So I'm going to pause for a moment, and I'd like you to think about this. What is? 22,998, or what is 28,553? Let's say that you're borrowing the money at 4% interest, and so what is the actual physical meaning of these numbers? Okay, so let's say that you find a lender who will give you the amount to finance these projects, and they want 4% interest. So what does the, uh, the present value represent when these revenues are being discounted at 4%? What did you write on the paper, in other words? 
Yes, go ahead. Okay, so it's the money that can be made from the project. Okay. That's right. It's the, it's the amount that's left over after you cover the borrowing costs. So the way to think of it is, you know, this $9,000 in year one, you don't get to keep all of that. You can put some of it in your pocket, but some of it has to go to the bank because they want their money back on the 50000 and they also want some profit. They want 4% profit on the initial investment. So the way that I wrote it was... Uh, the present worth amount represents the present value of the profits that you get to keep after paying back the 4% interest to the lender. I guess you're paying back not only the interest, but also the principal. Maybe I should write the principal and 4% interest. So you get to keep some of the profits, and the present value of those profits is what we calculated. So in other words, um, these projects should both be undertaken because you're getting some profit. Uh, the question is, you know, is it enough profit to justify bother, bothering doing the project? Well, yes, because you already said that what you need is a minimum of 4%, and both of them are above that. OK. Um, are there any questions about the project? Boy, I don't know. It kind of goes against my principles to end class this early, but that's all I've got for you today. So I'll see you on Wednesday. And uh, feel free to stop by if you have any questions on the homework or the project or anything at all. We've got lots of office hours, and it's generally pretty quiet.